Hello, everybody. My name is Francisco Pardo, and today I'm going to present the SCANTI 3 pipeline for isophone classification, annotation, and curation. After running ISOSIC 3 or any other tool to build a long read based transcriptome, this transcriptome can be used as a reference transcriptome. But before doing it, uh, <clears throat> going further in our research, it should be compared, annotated, and curated like any other, uh, any other reference transcriptome. For this purpose, we developed the SCANTI 3, which now has three steps. The first one is a quality control, then we filter, and then we rescue some of the ISO. About the SCANTI 3 quality control steps, the which is the main feature of SCANTI, what we do is to compare uh, the detected isoforms with the already annotated ones. For that, SCANTI established a classification system for the detected isoforms regarding the already refer uh, known reference transcript. Transcripts will be cataloged, uh, transcripts from known genes will be cataloged as full space match, inco uh, incomplete space match, novel in catalog, or novel not in catalog, depending if it is matching perfectly, something that is already known, partially, so we are missing some of the splice junction. This is a case of an incomplete splice match. But if we have some kind of novelty at the splice site level, for example, a new combination of already known splice junctions, we will call it this ISO for a novel in catalog. But if we detect a completely new splice site, this will be called a novel not in catalog ISO. About those transcripts, that are mapping to intergenic regions or to kind of weird that we won't address, we won't call them uh, that come from a known gene. We created five different categories, which are genic intron, genic genomic, antisense, fusion, or intergenic. These are what we call uh, transcripts from novel genes, even though, for example, in fusion genes. It's not for an actual novel gene. It's just a combination of two genes that are being expressed just in one transcript. Scanty also looks at this place junction level. And for that, uh, and doing that, we can uh, say if a certain place junction is, for example, no or novel, if it was previously annotated in the reference, but also looking at the genomic uh, sequence, we can say if that displays junction present a canonical or a non-canonical motif. Here we have two examples. The first one, it's like a perfect splice junction in which it perfectly matches something that is already annotated and present a canonical splicing motif. But in the second example, we have a novel splice junction with a non-canonical splicing motif. This is kind of this later example is, we will say kind of suspicious. Then SCANTI also can make usage of matching sorry data. So if you have not only pack biosequencing, but also Illumina sequencing or sort any type of sorry data, uh, you can try to identify individually space junction. And in this case, we see in this example that the known canonical space junction uh, has a lot of coverage by the sorry data, which is not the case in the suspicious uh splice junction so we'll probably try to remove all those isoforms presenting bad qualities attributes scanty also runs internally using the sorry data uh, calisto to quantify the isoforms that were detected and it also computes what we call a tss ratio for the tss ratio we define a boundary in the tss and we measure the coverage in the first 100 base pairs inside, downstream the TSS actually, and upstream the TSS. It will be outside. We calculate this ratio in order to know if there is actually an expression of uh, an if, of the expression of that TSS to be significant. So, if a TSS is actually true, we will expect a really high TSS ratio, at least higher than 1.5 or two. SCANTI3 for the quality, during the quality control step can also take gauge data or poly APICs to validate five prime and three prime. So in this case, we can try to address the 
com leanness of the, of the isoform that were identified uh, using isocity. Here is some example of the results that we obtained using scan T3 quality control, which end up uh, printing a big <laughs> PDF with a lot of plots. And here are some of them. Uh, for the double, we used in this case a double BTC11 dataset for uh, that was sequenced for the longer gas project. It's a really big dataset in which not only we had long reads, but also we have cage, uh, cage data and matching Illumina data. We have a lot of information about that, uh, about this cell line. In this case, we detected 30,000 genes and more than 200,000 isoforms. Being the most abundant structural category, the incomplete splice matches, meaning that we are probably having some kind of a uh, problem of degradation uh, in our sample. We also reported, for example, something oh, sorry, here that the novel noting catalog isoforms are enriched for, no, uh, for having splice junction without coverage, but also splice junction with non canonical splicing motifs. And I just want to mention that the new, this new metric, uh, this TSS ratio, is something new that we made. Up for, for scan T3, and we wanted to validate that. So, luckily, we have sample specific cage peak data for this double BTC level, and we can still calculate the TSS ratio using Illumina. Uh, putting together all this information, this is the result, this box plot in which we see clearly how all those TSS that were supported by cage data, they have also. A significantly higher TSS ratio. But in the case of those isoforms in which there is no support by cage, the TSS ratio is normally really low. It's, it's not higher than one, well, normally not higher than one point, uh, one point. So we know that we have a lot of art artifacts. We have uh, degradation, we have false splice junction, so we need to filter. Scan T3 implemented two different types of filters. The third one is a machine learning, in which the most important part, part is to define properly a true positive and a true negative set. From these two sets, a random forest algorithm will try to learn which are the attributes of a true isoform and an artifact, and it will filter all those uh, suspicious isoforms. Uh, in the case of the WBTC11, as I said, we have a lot of information, so we can build kind of complex rules for defining the true positive set and true negative set. But of course, remember always that if you use this Kanti uh, quality control attributes to define a true positive set and a true negative set, those attributes should be removed uh, for the random forest algorithm in order to avoid overfitting. The second approach for filtering using Scanty 3 is a rules filter. It's just setting as um, a group uh, certain thresholds for the attributes that were reported during the quality control and remove anything that do not fulfill uh, all these requirements. Again, for the double uh, VTC level, as we have cage data, sorry data, a really good annotation, we can make really complex rules and give several uh, opportunities to an ISO, uh, for an isoform to pass the filter. I, I just leave here written the, the rules, even though this is not really important. I think it's more important to show you how this changed uh, the actual uh, output. In the case of the machine learning uh, filter, it is really strict and it removed more than one fourth of the initial isoform that were detected and we, remain, we keep only more than 50,000 isoforms. In the case of the rules filters, as I said, rules are more flexible in, in our case, so more isoforms could pass all those filters. Uh, the, more, the most affected uh, mm, structural category in both cases were incomplete splice matches. So in 
we will say that using machine learning or the rules filter, we are removing in a lot of cases, probably a degradation of that. Um, <clears throat> but again, uh, Scanty also will report the important, the variable importance given by the uh, random forest algorithm and also the rule, the reasons why certain isoforms were removed. But what I think that is most important here is that this filtering solution leads us to another problem, which is using known transcripts and especially known genes that were detected initially, but they were removed. And here it is really clear how we started with more than uh, 30,000 um, reference annotated transcripts, or at least isoforms matching to a known isoform. And after filtering, this number of known isoforms detected is really, really drops, uh, really drops uh, a lot. How we solve this? Applying the rescue strategy again. Sorry, uh, this is a strategy implemented by Angeles in Scanty 3, in which we will take all those discarded, discarded transcript models and uh, they will be mapped against the reference. The reference annotation, annotated transcripts will, that were hit by any, any of these discarded transcripts will go again into the filter, uh, into the filtering. So this rescue strategy is really coupled with the filtering and all those targets in the reference annotation that actually pass the filter will be incorporated into the final transcript. In all cases, this is done without increasing redundancy. What I mean by this is that if uh, an artifact hits a reference transcript that is already represented in the filter transcriptome, the reference and uh, the reference transcript model will not be included in the final transcript uh, because it's already there. Here are some results again with the WBTC11 data set. Um, as I as you said, as I said previously, there's a huge drop in the number of isoforms de uh, detected uh, detected when we filter using the machine learning. This effect is not that big in the case of the rules, but again, we remove a lot of artifacts, but we want to bring back some of them that were actually good. And the whole idea of this was to not lose a lot of genes. And we get this. So even though we lose 3,000, 2,000 genes that were initially detected, we are then able to recover them through the rescue. We, have, uh, we wanted to also to, to evaluate how were these genes that were totally removed or removed but then rescued. And what it seems clear, regardless of the filtering strategy, what we see is that those genes that were lost but then rescued have a higher uh, expression value than the ones that are totally lost. And this is also common at the, when we uh, look at that at the transcript level. So anything that is totally removed, so we lose a reference transcript uh, through the filtering is probably because that reference transcript is also, is also really lowly expressed. When we recover them back from the reference, we rescue them, it's probably because they have a higher uh, expression value. Surprisingly, we even have some, I would say anecdotal, but this happens sometimes that after filtering and doing the rescue strategy, it is possible to hit something in the reference that was not previously reported in the initial transcript. And this is the case of first, this light blue new inclusion transcripts or genes that they are normally lowly expressed, but in the case here of the machine learning, uh, they are actually high, uh, have a high expression value. To validate the complete workflow, we use SIRPs, uh, we use some spikings, but as we know that our tool and our approach is biased for the reference, we trick a bit 
the annotation of the sheet. So we created a problem of our over annotation, something that we have in all the reference annotated uh, reference recipient. So we create, we include these shifts that were not actually spiking in the sample, but also we remove trusted model, well, shift models that were in the sample. So we can also address how good is our filter to remove things that are actually novel, but true. Um, good news is that the filter removes incredibly well, especially for the machine learning, all those partial true positives, so shorter versions of these pipings that were actually in the sample. And for the rules, this is sometimes more difficult to, to remove them because uh, as they are partial true positive, they will have coverage at the splice junction in all cases. If the annotation overlaps, there are some TSS that are actually like alternative TSS of the same version. So you end up thinking that a shorter version of the actual spiking is actually, but it's not the case. But again, we are able to, to remove most, most of them, all the false positives, so all these really spurious um, false splice junction are removed uh, with the filtering. But of course, we are also losing some true positive. And using the rescue strategy, we are able to recover some of these known true positives that were removed. Sadly, we cannot do that at the novel, uh, when they are novel, so it's not possible. Rescue strategy do not apply for novelty, so because we will be using, using the reference annotation. From here, what I, what I want to say is that through the entire uh, process, filtering has an effect on sensitivity by dropping it, but increasing the precision in all cases, especially for the machine learning. But also, um, what is clear is that the F-score, which is an average uh, metric between sensitivity and precision, increased uh, during the entire pipeline. So the final result is better, is more reliable than what we have at the beginning. And also, we maintain a pretty good novel discovery rate. So it's not like, okay, we filter anything that is new because we don't trust anything that is new in, in human, but here, ISOSIC and SCANTI present a really good, um, a good capability for detecting novel things and actually keep them if they really look like good isoforms. Finally, I want to mention the isoanod uh, tool, which is uh, like the second step of the whole functional isotranscriptomics framework. So this isoanod works for functional annotation of isoform at the isoform level. Right now, it's an in-house collection of scripts that needs to, to be adapted for each organism. And the final goal is to get a, an annotation file compatible with Tapas that Angeles will explain later. Right now, isoanod is not fully working because it's really tedious to run everything with all the different things that each uh, annotation and database have for all these pieces. So right now, what we have is a, like a bypass called isoanod light, in which uh, we have a bunch of pre-computed GFF3 files, for example, for human or sophila or mouse. We have the annotation of the reference at the isoform level, and we can transfer those annotated features into the curated uh, long read based transcriptome. The isoanod light tool is, was developed by Pedro, and Alessandra right now is working on Isoanod, building all these pre-computed GFF3 files. And so it can be, this can be used for more organisms and with more recent version of, of the annotation. So after running that, this and getting the full annotated transcriptome, we can go into Tapas. Uh, Tapas will be explained in a minute by Angeles. So that's it. Thank you very much for your time, uh, especially for Tulis, for inviting me to be here, and all the people in the lab that contributed to, <clears throat> to this work. Thank you.